You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and as you hear, I'm a bit hoarse today, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I also have three phenomenal, awesome kids who are fun little uh, rambunctious sometimes, but that makes them awesome and normal. Anyway, this show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. Today, we are having a guest back for part two of a show we did in August that was really one of my favorites thus far and based on all the positive email responses I got from so many listeners, I can say it was definitely a favorite amongst you guys out there also. So Elizabeth Gordon, MD, is back today to talk about sex and who doesn't want to have more sex. This time we're going to talk about getting even more physical. I'm going to spare everyone the metaphors that, frankly, come way too easily, jump right off my tongue. Um, Instead, go into Elizabeth's bio for anyone who doesn't remember. Dr. Gordon graduated with a BA from Johns Hopkins University, where she majored in the new concentration at the time of behavioral biology. After further research in the neurological basis of behavior, at NYU Langone Medical Center, Dr. Gordon obtained her MD at NYU School of Medicine, followed by a psychiatry residency at Beth Israel Hospital, where she was first trained in sexual medicine. She went on to pursue further training in sexual medicine and sex therapy, completing the training program in human sexuality at NYU School of Medicine. She currently has a private practice in Manhattan and, in addition, is a clinical instructor at NYU School of Medicine with a program in human sexuality. In her practice, she integrates a wide variety of complementary treatment techniques, from traditional Western medicine to a variety of talk therapies and standard sex therapy, to examination of nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle habits, as well as holistic, homeopathic, and Eastern medicine tailoring each treatment to the individual and their specific problems. You can find her on her website, psychandsexmd.com, and can email her at Elizabeth with, with an S, Gordon, MD, at gmail.com. So welcome back. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. So today we are going, I'm going to have one metaphor here, to go nuts and bolts. Sorry. Um we're going to talk about how to find time, how to enjoy sex more, have more sex despite having kids, right? But before we talk about that, after our last show, I received a bunch of emails from people who said, okay, is does Dr. Gordon do the same thing as on the show Mass, uh, what's it called? Not, um, the, not Masters and, yeah, Masters and Johnson, which is the Masters of, Masters of Sex. Right, Masters of Sex. I feel like that's not the name. That's what I said, but maybe it is. Anyway, so the show, for anyone who doesn't know the show, is loosely based on the bi- you know the work of Masters and Johnson. 
And it's really more focused on their private lives, but it does also talk about the work they do in which they have a clinic and they work closely with people. They watch them have sex. They recommend various techniques. But a big question that I think a lot of our listeners had is, are you watching people have sex? Are you, in some cases, you know, having hands-on involvement, which was part of the show. Um, I happen to know the answer is no, but can you speak to how things are different now compared to then? Um, and also what Masters and Johnson did for the field? Because I, I mean, they did a lot, correct? They did a lot. They did a huge amount. So to give a little background information in the um, middle of the last century, Kinsey uh, whom I'm sure people have heard about through a variety of sources, the Kinsey Report, um, had interviewed many people and basically compiled a lot of data to find out whether people were engaging in sex, how much they were engaging in sex, what kind of sex they were engaging in, and this was the first time that direct research had been broached and sex was approached in a more health-positive and what we refer to now as a sex-positive manner. Uh, Masters and Johnson essentially followed up on this research. So Kinsey was doing questionnaires to people and sending them out and getting personal anecdotes and personal reports back. Masters and Johnson set out to really look at the science behind sex, to look at the psychology, the physiology, the, the anatomy of sex. And their research first was looking at, um, literally looking at people having sex, so that they could figure out what was the uh, physiology of the sexual process. And they, from this research, which was initially uh, conducted with prostitutes, whom they felt would be very comfortable with the sexual process, they defined the stages of arousal, um, and first having excitement, then, which is the initial arousal, um, then having what was called the plateau phase before orgasm, having orgasm, and having the resolution phase. Um, this was huge research. Nobody had really understood what the process of sexual excitement and sexual peak and sexual resolution was before Masters and Johnson did their research. They also contributed some other very key understanding, understandings to the field. They discounted the model of the difference between vaginal orgasm and clitoral orgasm, which had been proposed by Freud, and said that female orgasm is the same no matter where the stimulation is being provided. And that was a very big finding for women because women had previously been, if not directly told, it had been implied that if they were only having clitoral stimulation orgasms, that there was something that was wrong with them or something that was not yet fully developed with them, that they were retarded in their development. Really? Um, so this was a big contribution. The later research that they contributed was not looking directly at people having sex, but they worked with individuals that were having problems with sexual function, which they had very carefully defined in some of their earlier research, and developed a program of intensive therapy that would then look at this sexual problem and try to treat that sexual problem directly. This was very big because prior to their development of essentially the first sex therapy, any sexual issues had really only been tackled in a more psychoanalytic method, and there wasn't necessarily a robust response to this treatment. So defining a sex therapy was very big, but their sex therapy was only conducted with couples, usually with married couples. You had to be within a couple to participate in this treatment, and it was an intensive two-week process, um, two weeks usually. And it was something that couples would go away for. So essentially you closeted yourself in the clinic for the intensive two-week process. Their sex therapy did not involve watching the couple have sex, but talking to them about the behavior of sex 
and then having the couple go perform sexual acts and come back and report on it. So that is similar to what sex therapy is like today. But the idea that somebody has to be in a couple to be able to conduct a sex therapy is no longer accepted. It is recommended that if somebody is within a couple that they bring their partner in to participate in the therapy because that can help facilitate the communication and make the treatment go faster, but it is not an absolute uh, priority for the treatment. Um, and they, the difference also is in what different techniques are being brought in. So they followed a very strict technique which they developed called Sensate Focus, where people looked at first their sensuality and slowly moved into their sexuality. And these days, while Sensate Focus is a very important component of sex therapy, again, sex therapy is often being tailored to the individual. And therapists are feeling more free to listen to where each person is starting out and where they are coming from, and then work with them to develop a treatment that touches upon or includes many different treatment types to figure out how to solve that individual's problem within the context of that individual's life and history. Does that help explain it? Absolutely. But I, and the only other question I think people may have um, in this show a big part of it is the notion that, you know, at, at, in the beginning of the show and then in season two, they participate, they are the subjects. Um, and then later in the show, um, I think you already said that this part is fabricated for the show, but, you know, they watch sometimes and there's, uh, and that's not true. But I think maybe you can speak to the, even outside of the show, but there is a, misconception, I think, when people say sex therapy, the notion that sex therapists are somehow involved, that there's any kind of beyond talking, um, there's no there is involvement. No, there is nothing more than talking within the office of a sex therapist. So the uh, person that is seeking help for their sexual issue comes in and talks about what is going on. And the sex therapist will get an entire history, just like any other healthcare provider, to try to put the sexual issue within a context and understand it better. And then what happens from there on out is that the individual and the therapist talk about what's going on. This is a behavioral therapy in that the therapist then says to the individual, I think that what you need to try is this. Here is some homework for you to try. Go home and try being sensual in this manner or go home and try being sexual in that manner and then come back and talk to me about how that worked for you, what came up for you, what was easy, what was difficult, and then we will make the next step. But there is never any sexual action. There's not even any undressing within the therapist's office. It's only a description of the process that occurs outside the office and the therapist helps the individual understand what goes on outside the office by talking about it within the office. That is very good clarification. And one other question that came up in a person's email is someone who goes and seeks uh, sex therapy, how long should they expect to be in treatment? That is another great question. I can say that the average treatment lasts a little over three months at once a week treatment. But this is with a huge caveat. Everybody is an individual. This average is a compilation of treatments for a wide variety of individuals. So that includes young women in their 20s who are having trouble with low desire and older men in their 70s and 80s who are having trouble with delayed ejaculation and have concomitant medical problems and are on multiple medications. So what number of treatments it will be for the individual 
cannot be determined before somebody comes in and usually can't be determined until well into a number of sessions. And then it can only be estimated. But this is, but it sounds like it's a pretty relatively shorter term treatment modality as compared to other forms of therapy. So people can expect to feel pretty, to have success in a relatively quick time, which is really pretty good. It's exciting for people. Yeah. We, we have to take a short break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. And when we get back, Dr. Gordon's going to help us to find time for sex. We're gonna, she's going to um, tell us ways that we can figure out with our partners how to basically get it done. So stay with us. Hello, everybody. This is Coach Betty Louise, and I have a question for you. When is the last time you looked in the mirror and saw your amazing beauty and sexuality? 80% of women do not have a positive body image. 97% of women do not like something about their bodies, and over 10 million women have eating disorders. In addition, at least 40% of women are sexually repressed, and one in seven marriages are sexless. I've just completed a book called Healing with Pleasure Medicine. What I will teach you is what gets in the way of your ability to see your beauty, sensuality, and sexuality. How to shift your perception to increase pleasure throughout your entire day. Okay, the place to find all of this information is CoachBettyLive.com. One more time, CoachBettyLive.com. Look forward to connecting. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sander, and today we are talking about ways to have more sex, to enjoy it more, to find more time for it with Dr. Elizabeth Gordon. And she actually just told us all about what she does being sex therapy. She also, I think, cleared up a lot of misconceptions which people may have that about sex therapy. And I think it's really important to understand what's true and what's not. But now we're going to talk about the, the good stuff, so to speak. Um, so, you know, as parents, it can be hard to find time to have sex. I mean, it's hard to find time to do anything. But frankly, I think sex is one of those things that can easily get put on the back burner in the face of having so many other stressors, etc. So how do you suggest that moms and dads, but, you know, we're talking about moms here, kind of get to do it? I think that this is a huge topic. This is one that I deal with when people come to see me quite often. And I think that the first barrier is that you need to understand you need to make time. But understanding that you need to make time and feeling okay about making the time are two different concepts. So, unfortunately, the first thing that gets in the way, and we talked about it a little on our last show, but I'd like to reiterate it, is guilt. People feel that if they are not attending to the children, if they are taking time for themselves and Sex is often seen as just something that's fun, uh, just something that doesn't need to be put in as a regular activity because it, that seems frivolous with their time when they are a busy parent. But actually, this guilt is misplaced. 
Um, we talked a little bit before about how really taking time for yourself is important. This is a major theme on your show. And how taking time for yourself to do things that you are passionate about, and hopefully you are passionate about sex, can really help make you a more fulfilled person as a mother or as a parent. And that leads to being a better parent because then you feel more free to give of yourself and have less resentment and bring more of yourself into the parenting mix. So it's very important to remember that you were a sexual person before you had children and that that part of your identity needs to remain there as part of who you are after you have children. And if there's any more information that you need to think about how to combat the guilt, I also say that it's extremely important for you as part of a couple to maintain your sexual activity. Maintaining a sexual relationship as a couple can help improve the bond that you have as a couple, which is important when dealing with the daily bombardment of stress that children can bring, and it can help you feel intimate with your partner so that you can talk more easily about what's going on and the frustrations of parenting. But it's also extremely important to remember that one of the best things you can do for your child or your children is to model a fulfilled relationship. And then your children will learn by observing on a daily basis what it means to be involved with somebody that they love, they care about, they cherish, and how to be cherished in return. And part of maintaining that a relationship, that bond and that intimacy with your partner, a very private part, but an essential part, is maintaining your sexual relationship with your partner. So in the long run, you're really helping your children learn what can be good as well as having some fun time for yourself. There's really no downside to this. So guilt is one of the ones that I want to get off the plate. On um, on a more concrete level, um, if you still think that you might have a sense of guilt, um, I really want to touch base on very concretely uh, having sex, having particularly having an orgasm, can help decrease your stress naturally. It is. Um, a way to reduce the levels of cortisol in your body, and that's the stress hormone. So if you're having more sex, if you are having more orgasms, you're probably going to be able to handle dealing with the children and the stresses and the ups and downs and the arguments or the timing issues more easily because you feel more mellow. Um, so the bottom line is really get to it. Um, <laughs> one last recommendation is if you need any other thing to think about it, Remember that sex, while not a lot of exercise, still is moving, and orgasm particularly can tire you out. It releases some oxytocin and it releases some vasopressin, which are two hormones that are really associated with a sense of sleepiness and with a sense of feeling good um, or a sense of well-being. So get to it. There are all sorts of reasons to be having sex and not a lot of reasons to not be having sex. Now that I've talked yeah. about eliminating the guilt, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was, um, go ahead. No, that was the next question I had. Go ahead, go. So how do you get to it? This really gets to almost the timing issue. Time is really critical. So you cannot have sex if you don't have time together alone. It's just physically impossible. So everybody knows children take a lot of time. So I wanted to talk about what you can do to carve out the time and what you should be doing with the time. So when you start to make the time, um, it, there are different issues along with different stages of development. So babies are very difficult. I fully acknowledge that. I have children of my own. I understand this. And babies seem to need you all of the time. They do sleep occasionally, but their patterns are not always steady. And when they are awake, they need to be held, they need to be touched, they need to be fed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's good news. Children under the age of one will not remember if you have sex in the room with them. That is proven. And babies sleep a lot, too. So one of the things to consider is 
grabbing those times when you have them, being flexible with your time. And maybe use it as a time to remember some of what it was like at the beginning of your relationship. Sex does not need to be only a bedtime activity. Be open to other times of day. When you were first in the relationship, I'm sure there was some passion, there was some spark, and you couldn't wait to have sex with your partner no matter when, no matter where, even if you were both working crazy hours, if you happened to be home together in the middle of the day, you would seize the opportunity. Now is the time to try to recreate that. If you have the opportunity, take it. Another thing to remember with babies is that midnight feeding or that middle of the night feeding. And remember how I just talked about how orgasm is a great way to feel sleepy? Well, after the feeding, what about some sex to help you get back to sleep? It's a quiet time. Nobody's bothering you. Even if the sex is relatively quick, it can be satisfying and it can have great benefits. Kids come with entirely different issues. Once they're past that baby stage and they are mobile, you have a lot less privacy. Especially when they're a toddler, they don't know how to knock on the door, they barge in. Um, it can be very, very stressful. One of the big recommendations is getting a lock for your door. Yes. Even if you're not comfortable. I'm sorry. I agree. I, I 100% agree with you. Get a lock. Get a it. lock Keep on the going. door can make a big difference. And it's, it's um, from a psychological perspective, it is okay for children to know that parents need some alone time. If you're not locking them out forever, then they will not feel neglected. They will not be neglected, but then you can lock the door and be appropriately dressed if they are knocking on the door. I have known many individuals, though, who still are not comfortable with having a lock. They feel this separates them from their children. And that is okay, too. There are other ways to figure out how to have some privacy or some moments to have sex with your partner. It, Can you I just, just make a quick a aside, bit. though? If you don't have mm -hmm. a lock, if the problem with not having a lock on your door, and I respect the notion that you want to feel that your child has the sense that they can always come in and that that security, but from the, especially the mom, but I guess, you know, both parents, you can't really relax, right? You're always going to have an ear out for that possible footstep, for the sound of someone shuffling down the hall and to really enjoy time with your partner, to really appreciate it and to really connect you it's not going to work if you're listening for, you know, the sound of crying and, I mean, we're all listening for that, but the sound of someone shuffling down the hall asking for a glass of water, you need to be able to really, because you're fearful they're going to bar, you know, open the door and run in, someone knocking on the door, that's okay. They can knock for a minute and you can say, hold on, you know, whatever. But if you're really fearful that they're about to barge through, you're not going to be able to actually enjoy sex the way that you otherwise would. That's just my two cents. Keep on going. Sorry. I think, I think that that is true, but where it comes down and where I sometimes see more difficulties with it is the impediment to particularly female orgasm. When women report that they really need to be able to let go and focus on the bodily sensation, and excuse me, and that's where the uh, one ear out for the child can be difficult. But there are ways with these individuals that really did not want to have a lock on the door that I've worked around that. If there's not a lock on the bedroom door, sometimes there's a lock on the bathroom door and mommy and daddy can take a shower together. Um, or doing it at times where you know the children are down and they 99% of the time do not get up for the first hour after they're asleep and then I urge people to take that time um, it still leaves room for that distraction but it can be accomplished but timing and privacy sometimes need some creativeness because it's not just within the bedroom but we'll talk more about creativeness in a moment um, one of the things I wanted 
I'm sorry. We we have to take a very short break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and when we get back, Dr. Gordon's going to continue to discuss how you can enhance your sex life. So stay with us. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together, we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Patricia Fayweather Harlow is passionate about the environment and conserving our natural resources. She's written a five-part book series for all ages called Rock with Rodney and Party with Perky to Preserve Wildlife, which brings awareness through these vibrant characters on preserving and protecting our national parks and historic landmarks. Harlow has launched a campaign to mobilize green supporters, informing a united front against big oil, big coal, and the Keystone XL pipeline. And she addresses the controversial practice of fracking in books four and five. She's determined to bring greater awareness to the dangers of drilling and running crude oil through pipelines that cut through pristine landscapes. And she empowers readers to take action in keeping America beautiful. To learn more about Patricia Fayweather Harlow and to purchase her books, visit www.patricia-fayweather-harlow.com. That's F-A-Y-E-R-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And play your part in preserving the landscape that we all share and love. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and today we are talking about a topic that is too often kept under the sheets, but also it's too often really put on the back burner in the setting of being a new parent, but also, frankly, just being a parent. We're talking about sex. And my guest, Elizabeth Gordon, Dr. Elizabeth Gordon, is a specialist in sex. Though we learned earlier, she totally hands off, of course, um, but she is telling us how to maximize our sex lives with our partners. So, Dr. Gordon, can you continue what you were saying earlier? Yes, I was talking about how to figure out how to create some privacy and then which is a good way to create time um, or how to really handle your time so that you can have sex. And it is physically impossible to have sex if you do not have some alone time together. So we talked about the potential for a lock on a door, but some other things are routines and handling children and daily life. Uh, One of the things I would highly recommend is to embrace quickies. Um, Quickies can be good. There may be days or sometimes even weeks or months when really that's all you have time for, but attempt to remember that the way I describe it is sex, like chocolate, some is better than none. <laughs> and that if you can keep that connection and keep it going, then you're more likely to be able to get into more, excuse the pun, but into more depth at some of your sexual encounters when you finally do have time. So... Try to think of it as one of those thrilling encounters that you used to have when you were a teenager or a young adult, when you were kind of sneaking around and trying to, again, pun intended, fit the sex in. Um, (laughs) I also like to say that you need to make it a priority. You have to let some things go, whether it's picking up every last toy or doing the dishes or limiting, even limiting the number of activities your children participate in so you're not worn out running them around. Choose something to let go. Uh, it really can be easier to let one or two of these things go if you look at sex as ranking in fun and ranking in importance as much higher than doing the dishes or than folding the laundry. And if you think about it very concretely like that, 
you probably agree with me that it is more fun and it is more important, which makes it easier to let some of those go. Dating is another thing I always recommend. It is extremely important to date. Dating can help maintain intimacy, but it can also be a great way to have sex. Be creative. Meet for a lunchtime date while the kids are in school or in daycare. And sometimes, instead of going out for dinner, you go to a hotel. And even if you can't do that, if that's a hardship financially, consider having the kids go to a babysitter or to a grandparent, and the babysitter or grandparent takes them out for dinner, and you stay home. You stay home, and then you have the whole house for yourself. So using these supportive services and giving yourself time is key to maintaining a sex life. Even if you have that time, sometimes it can be really hard to ramp back up into feeling sexy. That is one of the huge issues I hear about from parents. And you need to be in the mood to be able to really appreciate sex. So particularly as a new mother or as the primary caretaker to a young parent, you might feel exhausted, you might feel worn out, and as a birth mother, you definitely need a few-week hiatus from penetrative sexual activity. But once you're given the go-ahead, this is what I recommend. If you are feeling not so sexy or less than fully sexy, don't panic. That's natural. And it's that the desire is still there, but it's like a banked flame. It just takes some coaxing and a little bit of feeding to come back to life. And it can be very helpful to take some time for yourself to be sensual and then work your way up to sexual. You don't have to expect yourself to just dive back into being a hot and sexy individual. It can take time, but you will get there. Things I have recommended to people before, start with a warm bath, or if you can swing it, go out for a massage. Try to get back into your body as something that is sensual. Work your way up to reading erotica or watching porn and or masturbating. And discuss with your partner how he or she could be helpful by taking over some of the childcare duties. This is great because then your partner is bonding with the children, which helps the children and helps your partner, and it also benefits them indirectly because it will improve your sex life in the long run so they'll be having better sex with you. As the partner or co-parent, you know, one of the things that's not often addressed, and I think it needs to be, to be addressed, is that partners and co-parents also experience some of the same diminishment in libido. and When that happens, the advice I was just giving can be very helpful. Um, But even if they are not experiencing that diminishment, remember that you need to support your partner and that supporting your partner and being there for your partner really is proven through a few small studies to be one of the sexiest things that you can do for your partner. It is sexy and it helps your sex life in the long run. Support and that sense of caring was one of the biggest impactors on desire in new parents. So as a couple, together, what I recommend is conceptualizing this as a new start. You sometimes need to start again. So go back to sessions where you're kissing or petting to start to rebuild the sexy feelings. And this is really where intimacy and communication are key. If you've maintained that intimacy that I talked about in the last show, or if you continue to work to build it, it can be a lot easier to be sexy together. So there are a lot of different things that couples can do to maintain that sexiness and the sexual flirting and the intimacy. Um, I've heard of couples writing emails to each other through the day or making certain that they touch each other in a sexy way when they pass each other in the kitchen at night. Um, or even throughout the day, and all of these really help build appreciation and anticipation. I think I even saw at one point um, some list online, maybe there's more than one, about ways that people really try to stay sexy with their partner. So maybe that's a great place to look for, for individuals that are trying to find some ideas. So once you're starting to get back in the mood together, um, Oh, you know, one thing I never, I forgot to mention as I think about getting back in the mood together and being in the mood together is if you are really having trouble getting back in the mood, taking that time away from everything else can be very helpful. And using these techniques where you're ramping up. But if it really, you really need to be back in the mood and it's difficult, then maybe you need to take a little bit more time away. 
and consider a vacation together. And I know that's difficult, particularly when people have infants or new babies. But a vacation doesn't have to be a long time. It can even be a day without an overnight, as long as it's together and not with the child. There's a truism that I once heard, and I often repeat it. There is no vacation with small children. There is that only is so a change of scenery. True. Oh, my God, yes. There is only a change of scenery. So if you really need a vacation, if you really need time alone, consider taking at least one day, maybe an overnight if you can swing it, but at least that time together to use some of these techniques to ramp up together. Or down the line, if you are ramped up, to maintain that sexiness and do a reset as a couple, as sexy individuals and not just parents. So... Those are my recommendations for getting back into sex. Trouble is, sometimes people encounter some physical issues, and I really want to talk about these as, as impediments to the sexual process. Um, and my background as a physician, I feel that these are very important to address and to put out in the open because often people are ashamed to talk about them. One of the first things that comes up, one of the most common problems is pain or change in sensation after a woman has given birth. And some of that pain may be related to dryness. But I tell women they don't need to be concerned. There are a lot of hormones in play after birth, especially if you're breastfeeding. And it's very important for women to understand this. I wish that all birth healthcare providers were informing women of what it might be like sexually after birth so that they didn't get frightened by this change and they walked into it with some knowledge. It's also important for partners to know this. So if you are a new mom or you're a mom-to-be, please let your partner know that this may happen. May happen, may not happen, but if you know, it doesn't frighten you. And here's the thing. This is not reflective of a woman's desire. It is purely hormonal. It is caused by decreased estrogen, which leads to decreased lubrication. That dryness can so easily be fixed with a water-based lubricant, and now they're found at every large chain drugstore. You can go to the corner and find it, or go to the average drugstore in your town and pick one up, which is a far cry than it was 20 years ago when you had to order them online or go to the adult uh, adult toy stores. So (laughs) these days, this is very, very easily and very cheaply solved. Now, Sometimes quick question, women have, how long mm-hmm. does that, so once a woman has stopped nursing, so, you know, hormonally, she's presumably back at her baseline, right? So let's say a month, two months post nursing, so she's weaned, when should she no longer have pain? Like at what point should she actually go to her is coming from. So if this is pain from uh, dryness, that should start to ease up with increased lubrication as a woman is beginning the weaning process, if not sooner. So if a woman is breastfeeding for a long time, over a year or two, some of these changes can, uh, or some of your, the body rebound can happen even while you're breastfeeding. Um, but if you are breastfeeding for a few weeks or a few months, then as you wean the baby and breastfeed less, you should have some rebound of the estrogen leading to some rebound of vaginal lubrication. Where should you continue to, um, or if, if you do continue to have pain, if, you, if anybody has had pain throughout the process of breastfeeding that is not alleviated by a water-based lubricant, um, or is pain that is specific to a, a, a specific vaginal region, um, related to vaginal trauma, such as tearing or episiotomy or stitches, then don't wait. Don't wait. Go talk to your healthcare provider. There are so many ways to handle this pain. I was just about to talk about one of the ways, which is if you're noticing pain, one of the first things to try is to start with a progressive process where you start to with gentle touches and lubrication, uh, a water-based lubricant, and you work your way up to insertion, first with a tongue, then with a fingertip, then an entire finger, up to penile penetration, and you acclimate the nerve endings. But if this isn't working, talk with your healthcare provider. 
There are sex therapists who are experienced in handling this. There are pelvic floor rehabilitationists who are actually hand, hands-on uh, providers of diagnosis and care and can help you figure out what is going on with the pelvic floor or with the pelvic region and whether there are exercises or treatments that might be available for you. And sometimes the problem is very simple and can even be fixed by your midwife or OB-GYN or whomever your general health care provider is. Don't wait. Don't be ashamed. Seek help. Don't wait with pain. That is my biggest message. Good pitch. It's important. We have to take a short break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and when we return, we're going to continue discussing how to improve your sex life, and then Dr. Gordon's going to give us some last thoughts, and we just heard a really important one being don't live with pain. Very important. So if that was good, think about what other one she's going to give us. Don't go away. You don't want to miss it. Baby boomers face many challenges, and sometimes you have to reinvent yourself in order to stay on top. Sharon Ball, nurse practitioner and Christian life and wellness coach, can help. Sharon has written a book called Reinventing Yourself Today, and it can help you through the pangs of changing the course of your life. Whether you are looking to stay on track with new goals, a sensible program to help you shed unwanted pounds, or a full kick-butt life reinvention, Sharon can work with you. Follow your passions and live each day according to your dreams and free yourself from the expectations of others. Sharon comes from the heart and shares her own personal journey to reinvention with her clients. Other self-help books inspired her, but few gave her the steps to improve her life, so she created a plan that works. Stress no more. Let Sharon Ball open the door. Sign up for a complimentary life reinvention consultation today at tinyurl.com forward slash get started for free for more of what life has in store. Jenny Friend is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical sexologist, commonly known as a sex therapist with over 30 years of experience in the field of sexuality. She's been a researcher and teacher and is further trained in human development over the lifespan. She's also a published author and a radio personality. Her specialized training in lifespan developments means she can help individuals, couples, and families through difficult developmental phases. Her primary ways of working are through the tools of cognitive, behavioral, and psychoenergetics theories and techniques. Couples, individual men and women, and families are also welcome. She can meet in her office in Costa Mesa, California, or on the Internet through Skype at Jenny Friend MFT. Call 714-210-9200. You can also send an email from her website at www.centerforclarity.org. That phone number again is 714-210-9200. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and today we are talking about sex. Everyone should have more. Most of us aren't having enough. Dr. Elizabeth Gordon is here to tell us why why we should have more. Well, we all know we should have more, but she's telling us how to have more. So, Dr. Gordon, before the break, you were imparting on us that pain is not something to live with, correct? Pain is not something to live with. It is definitely not something to live with. So I was recommending that if there's pain that is ongoing that doesn't seem to be related to dryness, that isn't fixed with a lubricant, that you may have tried starting out gently and slowly and working your way up, you should contact your healthcare provider. There are so many ways to fix this. And the other one I wanted to mention is sometimes it's not that it is actually painful sex, but it just feels different. Now, sex after birth definitely can feel different. There is stretching of the muscles of the vagina and the pelvic floor. This often resolves with time. Uh, To speed things along, you might want to try some Kegel exercises, but you may also want to talk with your OB-GYN or other birth birth health care provider. Things to do in the meantime to help it feel better is try different positions or try pillows. Try to vary the depth or the angle of penetration. But if none of this is working, talk to somebody. These are issues are not uncommon, and you are not alone, and you should not feel a sense of shame 
and they can be fixed, and you can get back to a pain-free, satisfying life. One of the other issues that women really come to talk to me about is dealing with body image concerns after having had a baby. And if these concerns are really inhibiting you, there are a variety of things to try. The first one I always recommend is remember that you have performed a most awe-inspiring feat. You have produced another human being. That is the most powerful thing that anybody can do across the board. That is absolutely the most amazing thing you can do. And for most people, that is pretty much everybody not in the public eye that is paid to recover within weeks, it takes a while to recover. I really work with women to get them to try to focus on the strength and the power that it took to create the child and to grace themselves with time to recover and to focus on how they have produced another human being. And if there are changes to the body, those are negligible compared to the wonder that is their child. It's also very important for women to talk to their partners. Most partners are much more focused on what you have done, what you have created, and how amazing that is. And they are, most partners are really aroused by how powerful you and your body are. So hearing that from a supportive partner can be very helpful and can go a long way to allaying a woman's fears that she might look different than she did before childbirth. I have to add an anecdote. I really, I'm sorry? Oh, I was just going to say, and also, we see ourselves differently than men do. You see, you know, uh, your midsection as being so big. Men don't, men don't critique it as harshly as women do. So try to remember that men are not seeing in the mirror what women see. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Go on. Oh, no problem. I think that there's two, two important anecdotes. One is that somebody was recently saying to me, well, I, I feel some concern about my body. And when I asked, well, have you noticed every, all the ways in which your partner is not the same as when you met them? She said, you know, I never think about it. I said, well, now try to remember that your partner doesn't notice those small changes in you either and is so busy being overwhelmed with how you manage to produce this human being that those small changes pale even more. Um, but I also have to add this anecdote. I was recently talking to a gentleman and asked him along these lines, what would you want to know about sex, after you, sex with your partner after you've had children? And he said to me, I really wish that my wife would see herself as the absolute goddess that I see her as that she created life. This was so awe-inspiring, and I wish that she would understand that her concerns about her body are so not my concerns, that I'm just blown away with what she was able to accomplish and find her even more sexy and more beautiful and more lovable than she ever was before. And I thought that was so beautiful, but is not an untypical answer. Many men feel this way. Many partners feel this way. And I also recommend ignore the celebrity media. Try checking out these real people websites. I have a few tips. One is the Belly Project. Another is the Vagina Project. Or the third one I recommend is the Great Wall of Vagina. These are images of what real people look like and can help remind you that the photoshopped images of celebrities do not portray the wide variety of beautiful variations that real bodies encompass. But if any of these things really are still inhibiting your sex life or making you feel uncomfortable in your day-to-day existence, please, again, talk with your health care provider. Ask them for further suggestions or ask them for a referral to a therapist. But also talk with your partner because your partner knowing what is going on with you can really help the two of you bond more and feel more connected rather than leading to a sense of isolation. It will increase the intimacy and create a sense of support, which can go a long way to alleviating the anxiety and in the long run, go a long way to a better sex life and a better relationship. So that is my take-home message on how to deal with body image concerns. You know, the last two things I really want to talk about for physical elements are the are breastfeeding and being touched out. Uh, breastfeeding has practical ways of getting around it. Try wearing a bra. Try different positions if you feel that your breasts hurt. 
and being touched out, there are also ways to deal with it. Discuss this with your partner would be my key take-home message, though. Let your partner know that it's not them, but that you feel overwhelmed and that you need to take a little time off from being touched. But also try talking with your partner about the possibility of doing what we call an episode of purely receptive touch. That is, your partner touches you purely sensually, not sexually, and only escalates to a sexual touch if you give the go-ahead. This sometimes can help provide a reset and help put you in a in a mindset in which really touch does not just equal a need for you to respond and to give of yourself, whether to your children or sexually. So those are some of the major points. You know, there is so much about this that we didn't even get to that I would love you to come on again. We're going to find another date. I'm sure our listeners would love that. And tell our listeners how they can find you again online. What's your website? website? Psych, P-S-Y-C-H, and sex, md.com. That's psych and sex, md.com. I'm also available on my... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm also available by email. Uh, My phone number and email are on the website, but my email is Elizabeth, E-L-I-S-A-B-E-T-H, Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, M-D, at gmail.com. Fabulous. Thank you. And next week, come back. We're going to welcome a child psychiatrist who's going to help us learn how to differentiate between normal developmental hurdles versus actual learning issues and what to do to help your child in either case. Don't forget, you can always email me, cs at carlysnydermd.com. I'll always happily answer your questions. You can always find me on my website, carlysnydermd.com where there are many blog posts about women's mental health and wellness. Come back every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Or you can go on the BBM Global Network website, bbmglobalnetwork.com, anytime for the show, MD md for moms This has been an episode of md for moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.